you sit down to meditate, one of the first things you want to do is to establish a sense of well-being. And this is easiest if your life has been conducive to establishing a sense of well-being. If you've been making a practice of being generous, if you're clear about the principles and precepts that you want to follow in your behavior of not harming other people, not harming yourself. Then that right there creates a sense of well-being as you reflect back on your generosity, reflect back on your virtue. Think of the times when you went out of your way to be good to other people, when you went out of your way to avoid doing harm to other people. That's food for the mind. This is why generosity and virtue are part of the path. As the Buddha said, when he started teaching right view, on the most mundane level, it starts as simply, you know, there is there are gifts. It sounds strange that that would be a principle of right view. But he was countering a thought that was widespread, or at least had some adherence in that time, that everything in life was deterministic. They had a very mechanical view of causality, that the stars acted through you, or there were these outside forces that had totally determined from the very beginning, from the design of the universe, that things were going to have to work out a certain way. And therefore, whatever you did was meaningless. It was simply part of the machinery. And so an act of generosity is, doesn't have any special value. It's just written into the way things are going to have to be. And so to counter the idea of determinism, the Buddha started out, there are gifts. People do make gifts, and they really do have meaning, both for the donor and for the recipient. In one way, you could say that he staked his whole teaching on that connection between freedom and generosity. And people would come to ask him, where should a gift be given? He would say, wherever your mind feels inspired, wherever you feel it would be well used. In other words, generosity is free, no restrictions. No, you should give here, you shouldn't give there. In fact, when monks are asked, where should this gift be given, again, that's the response they're supposed to give. Wherever your heart feels inspired, wherever you feel the gift would be well used. And in exercising that freedom, we create a sense of well-being in the mind. So it's a basic principle of our freedom, and it's also a basic principle of the practice, how you take advantage of that freedom. Because when you give a gift, that doesn't harm yourself, doesn't harm other people. It is food for the mind, food for other good qualities in the mind. This is why when you look at the history of Buddhism across the centuries, you see that when people misunderstand the idea of generosity, the Dharma gets twisted as well. There's a series of texts called the Apadanas. It's the very last addition to the Pali Canon. It was obviously written at a time when monasteries were going large and monks wanted donations. And they tried to do what they could to encourage people to be generous, more generous than they might feel freely inspired to be generous. And so they promised huge rewards for generosity. Give a little gift, guaranteed to become an arahant in a time of a future Buddha. And you would, in the meantime, you're not going to experience any of the lower realms. You've got to be king of the devas, queen of the devas. Many, many aeons get to be kings or queens on earth. 
countless times. And after a good long joy ride through samsara, when you've decided you've had enough, okay, then you're ready to become an arahant. And if you want to become a special arahant, well, it's going to cost you a little extra, but it can be arranged. The going price to be a, an arahant with special distinctions was seven days' worth of meals for the whole sangha. As you can see what's happening here, the monks are beginning to take the teaching on generosity and they're twisting it to their own ends. And as generosity gets twisted, the teaching gets twisted as well. The Eightfold Path disappears into the background. The fact that you're generous in what they call the Buddha field, the field of the Buddha's potential for creating lots of meritorious rewards for a little tiny meritorious gift. That becomes the important thing. You do service to the Buddha and then awakening is guaranteed. So once generosity gets screwed into strange shapes like this, the Dharma gets screwed into shame, shame, str screwed into strange shapes as well. So it's good not to overlook the basics. and to have a right understanding of what the basics are all about. That way you keep the rest of the practice in line. Generosity is a freely given gift, where you feel inspired. The Buddha does note that some gifts give greater benefits than others. But it's up to you to decide what you want to give, where you want to give it. And the monks have lots of rules for how to behave as they receive gifts. They can't go out of the way to attract gifts to themselves, away from other monks. And when they've been given a gift, they can't turn around and give it back to lay people. They can share it among other monks, but they're not supposed to say, take something given to them and give it to a lay person that they're trying to please. Sometimes we have a tendency to disregard the vinya. Well, it's just a bunch of rules from old times that may or may not be applicable now. But a lot of the rules have to do with this, how to behave in an economy of gifts, in a culture of gifts. Because the principle of gift-giving goes way back, much earlier than the Buddha. Sometimes in those Dana talks they say, in Dana is a 2,500-year-old tradition. Well, it's not. It's a much older tradition than that. It goes back to the beginning of human society. Human society is based on gifts. I read once that the very first book in anthropology was an analysis of gift-giving in different societies, how much you can understand about a society by the way people give gifts, the gestures with which they give gifts, the expectations. It tells you a lot about how that society is organized. And it's the same in the principles of the Buddha's teachings. He created a culture of gifts. So the practice of the Dharma can be surrounded by gift-giving. Because one of the good features about giving a gift is that it breaks down barriers. When you place a price on something, say, like, I'll do X for you in exchange for Y, that's creating a barrier. X is not going to happen until a Y comes. But when you give a gift, it's like being part of a family. It involves the same network of responsibilities and connections, which is a good environment for practicing the Dharma, teaching the Dharma. The Buddha said at one point, one of the ideal features of a Dharma teacher is not to expect material reward for the teaching. He never said that the Dharma is priceless. That's another phrase you hear a lot in Dana talks. What he did say was that 
the teacher should not expect material reward. In other words, the teaching of Dharma should be a gift. When it's given as a gift, people receive it as a gift. When it's given as something you're expected to get payment for, people will expect something for their payment and start making demands. Sometimes the demands may be subtle, just simply if you're sitting listening to a Dharma talk and the teacher looks out across the audience and starts talking about things that the people don't like to hear, you can see it in their faces. And if the teacher's concerned about how much money is going to come from the Dharma talk, he's going to start avoiding the things that are difficult to talk about. So this is another one of the arrangements that the Buddha created, was a situation in which people practice the Dharma, can depend on gifts, are supposed to live a frugal life. And the gifts are not contingent on teaching. That way the teaching can be free. Less likely to be distorted. In fact, there have been periods in the history of Buddhism when monks would put fans in front of their faces so they wouldn't read the reaction of the people out there, the idea being they'd be more likely to actually hear the genuine Dharma when the speaker isn't trying to read the audience and please them. So gifts are freely given, but there are things incumbent on understanding the right relationship there. And once the gift is given, it's given. Those rules in the Vinaya are not only designed for the monks, they're also designed for the donors. When a gift is given, There's no expectation of services in return. This is a lesson that a lot of people, not only here in the West, have trouble understanding. It's something that constantly has to be reiterated back in Asia. And as for the monks, as the recipients of the gifts, they have the responsibilities as well to behave in a way that's deserving of gifts. Because after all, as, uh, as individuals, they're taking advantage of a larger system. They're benefiting from a larger system. And one of their responsibilities is to keep the system going. If they accept people's gifts but start behaving in ways that are uninspiring, it starts drawing up the gifts for the other monks as well. And it breaks a sense of trust, because that's what giving relies on you trust one another. And this is what probably one of the most important aspects of creating this culture of giving, is that the Dharma is a lot more likely to survive in an atmosphere of trust. This is one of the ways that we create a sense of well-being, even before we sit down and close our eyes, trying to understand this culture of giving, and in to participate in it as we feel so motivated, because it does emphasize our freedom. That's the beginning of the training of the mind. We're free to train the mind. Now the requirements of aging, illness, and death can force us. But there are lots of people out there who choose not to practice. And the Buddha is wise enough to see you can't force people to practice the Dharma. But you can invite them. And the best way to invite them is to practice the Dharma yourself so the results become apparent and they get interested. So the practice is done in the same in the same spirit as giving a gift. You feel so motivated to do this. So each time you sit down to meditate, 
You realize on the one hand they're aging, illness, and death are breathing down your neck. So you've got to do something. But as you think about it, you realize okay, this is a good thing to do. If you practice with a sense of being inspired to practice, the results are much more likely to come. John Cha is famous for saying that when you feel like practicing, you practice. When you don't feel like practicing, you practice. And how do you do that? If you look at yourself and you say, I'm just not in the mood to practice, you think yourself into a position when you realize that deep down inside, yes, you really would prefer to practice, regardless of whatever vagrant moods are coming through the mind. So at least part of you feels inspired, part of you realizes, okay, this is, this is the way to freedom, by exercising your freedom to practice. This is one of the things we're going to explore as we practice further, is what is this element of freedom in the mind? We do have this choice. What is it to make a choice? This is why we practice meditation, is to understand the process of making a choice, to see our intentions. This is why we practice concentration, to establish a firm intention in the mind and then watch it, to see what happens when other intentions come in. Then you make the choice to stick with your original intention again and again and again. There's an element of freedom in there, and that's what you're trying to catch sight of. So in this way, the freedom that we're looking for, that's free from suffering, totally free from any burdens for the mind, any restrictions on the mind at all, starts by exercising that freedom to give. 